Um, evening, everybody. My name is Nick Dasher Brown. I look after the investor relations side at Anexo Group PLC. And rather like Paul, there are a few familiar faces here. So nice to see everybody again in person. Um, as always, the best way to start these presentations is what do we do and why are we good at it? So Anexo is, was originally a one-stop shop for the victims of non-fault traffic accidents. Um, we were established in 1996. And ultimately, we, we, we concentrate on the impecunious driver. That's people who haven't got any money. It's people who don't have the wherewithal to uh, replace their damaged vehicle through their own resources. They're not able to buy another car. They're not able to hire another car. They have no credit. Therefore, basically, they're on the bus. Um, our job, therefore, is to provide them with a replacement vehicle and claim the cost of the repair or the write-off of the at-fault motorist's insurer. Uh, and in the meantime, we're able to hire out those vehicles at credit hire charges, which are higher than the average spot rate that you and I would get if we uh, booked a, a car for our holiday in, in six weeks' time. So we have three key divisions. One is DAMS, which is direct accident management. That's cars and light commercials. MCAMS, which is motorcycles, and, and a large part of our fleet now is, is motorbikes. And CAMS, which is provision of bicycles. And the key to what we do is our sales network of independent garages. Um, our customers can't go to their insurance companies. Why can't they go to their insurance companies? Mainly for three reasons. Number one, if they've got a no claims bonus, they haven't ticked the box for no claims protection. Number two, they won't have ticked, ticked the box for a replacement vehicle. And most importantly, they will have kept their insurance excess as high as possible because it bring, brings their premium down. So these people are just interested in being road legal. They've got to have insurance of some description. A lot of it is third party fire and theft. The more they can put their excess up, the less their premium is. If you've got a thousand pound car, it's got a thousand pounds worth of damage and your excess is a thousand pounds, you've got nowhere to go. So what happens is they go to their independent garage, what Alan Sellers, our chairman calls Fred in a shed, which is as good a description as any. I'm sure you've got one, I've got one. Uh, and very good they are too. It's two guys with an inspection pit and a tin of small figure. And they say to them, can you get this fixed? If they're in luck, then it'll be one of ours, uh, one of our network of about 1,100 uh, repair shops, which are looked after by our sales team. And if that's the case, they'll be referred to us. We will look at the case. And if we take it on, we'll get a vehicle out to them. We will get the vehicle repaired at our expense. And as I say, we will claim the business, back, the, the, the costs back from the insurance company. Now, historically, with insurance companies, as you know, their, their job is not to pay out on anything. Uh, their job is to protect their balance sheets. So we would write to the insurance company, and as always, they would routinely ignore us. We'd write to them again and routinely ignore us. So rather than spend all this time writing to them, although we do do that, uh, we have our legal services division, Bond Turner, which is wholly owned by us, and all our business from Edge goes through Bond Turner. It's very straightforward. If the insurance company ignores us, we issue a writ, and we take them to court for the costs which they owe us. So that is what our legal practice does. We, uh, we have a very good success rate, which I'll come on to in a minute. But we're not just a credit hire business. We do do um, recovery of hire charges and everything else from the at-fault insurers. And we have various personal injury things in, in, in association with that. We also do personal injuries elsewhere. We do industrial accidents. We do clinical and professional negligence. We have a decent business and growing business in housing disrepair, which I'll come on to in due course. And we also do class actions, and that includes the emissions claims, uh, the most recent one being VW, which I'm sure you're aware of. So everything that we do goes through Bond Turner, um, and Alan Sellers oversees the whole thing. Just to give you an idea of our financial highlights, we, 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 this is from the interim stage. What we wanted to do is break down the revenues by our divisions, just to show you where the, where the, where the money comes from. So credit hire um, is a... a, is a, is a a uh, decent part of our business, other legal services in there, and housing disrepair is relatively small, but growing. Credit hire, I'll come on to this, we've been managing it very conservatively, which is why the numbers have been down. Uh, and the, the reason for that is basically we're looking to generate cash. And if you look further down, you'll see that we've generated cash from operating activities, um, as opposed to using up cash. Now, to grow this business requires capital. Uh, to put a vehicle on the road requires capital. To pay for a repair, requires capital. So it's very working capital intensive. And obviously, it's not very difficult to grow your business by taking on more debt to finance that working capital. We are very lucky because we have two levers we can press. We can put more vehicles on the road and absorb capital. 
If we feel that we're getting a bit stretched, then we can reduce the number of vehicles we put on the road and increase our cash collections through Bond Turner. We, have, we, we, we will settle normally out of court. Nearly all our cases settle before they go to court. And we have some control over the level of settlement that we can do. So we have the ability either to absorb cash by growing the business or to generate cash by managing it carefully and making sure that we settle cases in a timely and appropriate fashion. And that's what we're doing for 2023. The message from the city, which we got when we were going around in 2022, was loud and clear, which is, we like the business, we like the growth of the business, we'd like you to prove that you can do it and generate cash. Now, we did that back in 2000 and beginning of 2020, uh, when once again we decided we were going to generate cash to prove that we could do it. And this is the exercise that we're going through now. And you'll see that net debt has come down in the first half quite significantly. Part of that is due to admissions. I'll come on to that. But basically, the business is being run for cash this year. And that's reflected in the numbers that come through. So what are our differentiators? I'm not going to bang the drum on this, but we, are, we do provide a social service. Without us, our people, the, our customers are, are really stuck. Uh, as I say, they haven't got the money to provide a vehicle of their own. Nobody else is going to give them one. They can't use a credit card because they've got no credit. Quite often, they're running on, on, on a very basic uh, income. So without us, either they can't work because they're working as delivery drivers or whatever it may be, uh, or else they're taking the kids to school on the bus. You know, th this is a problem. And it is the common law principle, you should treat your victim as you find him, if or her. If they are inconvenienced by circumstances beyond their control, why should they be on the bus? And we have a number of Supreme Court decisions which underline the fact that the person should be put in the position they would have been if the third party had not caused the accident. If they, if they had a car, they get a car. If they had a motorbike, they get a motorbike. And also, they get an appropriate one. Um, years ago, I got given a, a replacement car, and I was trying to fit four children and two adults in a Renault Clio. That wasn't very helpful. If they've got a people carrier, they get a people carrier. If they, if they just need a, a two-door car, they'll get a two-door car. So it is very much putting them in the situation they would otherwise have been in. Um, as I say, the impecunious market I've run through, I think that makes sense. A lot of our motorcycle people are couriers, so it's been a huge growth area. Uh, if we can be said to have a good pandemic, we had quite a good pandemic because the one people who were really busy were the delivery drivers. And most of our motorcycle fleet is those one, two, five twist and go things that you see around. It remains a huge growth market. As somebody pointed out to me, if you go to the average McDonald's, there are more people outside on scooters waiting for their delivery to be given to them to, to pass it on than their actual customers inside the shop. Why anybody would want a McDonald's that's been on the back of somebody's bike for 20 minutes, I have no idea, but that's up to them. Um, there are barriers to entry with this. Um, one of the barriers to entry is our, our um, portfolio of garages. It's very difficult to build up 1,100 across England and Wales. It would take a long time and cost a lot of money. But the other barrier to entry is there aren't many lawyers who specialize in what we specialize in, in credit hire, housing disrepair, emissions, and so on. Uh, we have offices in Liverpool and in Bolton and in Leeds. Uh, we're always looking to open offices elsewhere. It's entirely possible we'll do one over the next couple of years. Uh, and we want to make sure that we get the people with the right sort of expertise. You can't take a solicitor who's been involved in, I don't know, convincing or whatever, and then put them onto this. It takes specialist training. So one of the things we have done is set up a thing called the Inexo Academy, and we take the bright young things who are coming into the business, and we'll train them up. If they're paralegals, we'll get them through their qualifications. We'll get them to, to, to full solicitor status. Uh, and it's one way of making sure that the business can continue to grow. We have a screening team who look out for potentially cases that, that, that will fail. Um, ultimately, our screening is pretty effective. We've got people who've been doing it for a very long time. So they can usually tell whether something is going to be workable or not. An awful lot of the time, you have an admission from the other side. The guy goes, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't see you. Bingo, you know you're home and dry there. Um, uh, other, other times, it may be that it's a he said, she said. And sometimes, if it's a case where we think there is a, an element of doubt, which, if it goes to court, will cause us difficulty, we won't take the case on. So we try and make sure that we only take cases on that we think we can win. Um, the, vast, the, excuse me, the vast majority settle before the court appearance. The delay and the long cash tail that we have <coughs> is due to the fact that it takes quite a long time to get a court date. If I were to apply for a court date today, I would probably be allocated one in about 18 months' time. That is a function of the pressure on the court service. The number of courts is reduced. There are a lot of court cases coming through. One of the things that's helping us there 
is the Civil Liabilities Act, which has reduced or more or less destroyed the whiplash market. We're not involved in the whiplash claims. And the fact that those are no longer viable for solicitors is freeing up a lot more court time. So we're seeing the number of debtor days that we've got coming down. They're still high. But from our perspective, you have to understand that we know when we ask for the court date that we're going to get our money. There's nothing that's going to get in the way of that. We just have to be patient and wait for it to come through at that particular stage. Um, a lot of our customers come from word of mouth. You know, if, you, if, 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 the, if the chap gets his car fixed by one of our garages, of course he tells all his friends about it. The garages like it because they get paid in full and on time. Uh, and also we do use social media for this and other parts of our business. So very quickly, just to go through credit hire, there's a, there's a huge, huge market here. Uh, if you look at the statistics on the right-hand side, 33 million cars, 1.4 million motorcycles. Um, the gig economy, nearly 4 million people are involved in driving jobs, whether it's delivering the groceries, doing scooter work, being on, on, uh, working for, for parcel delivery. It's a huge amount. If you have a motorcycle, certainly in central London and in most urban areas, it's not really a question of are you going to get knocked off. It's a question of when are you going to get knocked off and how much is it going to hurt if it does. So we, we, you know, there, there is a huge turnover with these things. We have a tiny market share of this, so there is room to grow. And nobody else really does what we do. They really don't. There are one or two people who do it on a very small scale, but across England and Wales, we are, we are the market leader by some way. We do do personal accident when it's part of a, of, a, of a repair, but we're not ambulance chasers. We're not personal accident focused. We're focused on the vehicle uh, and, and the vehicle and, and associated costs. So for instance, if you get knocked off your motorbike and your motorcycle leathers, which cost 300 pounds, they're going to be ruined. So that is part of the claim. So that is something that gets put through. Looking at other legal services and class actions, obviously the big one here is the emissions case. Uh, for those of you who, who may not have heard of this, I imagine most of you have, but the idea is that um, most vehicle manufacturers of diesel cars put in a cheat device so that when it was activated, the emissions were shown to be lower than they actually were. Uh, this has been, there have been cases which have been settled across the world, America, Canada, Brazil, Australia, uh, we reached an agreement with VW earlier on this year. Uh, we're very restricted into what we can say about that, but it resulted in a net cash, net, net, net of everything, cash position to the company of about £7.2 million. In other words, we had £7.2 million which appeared in the bank, which wasn't there before. Um, we're currently pursuing the similar action against Mercedes. Uh, we would, it's very difficult to put a time scale on this. Uh, rather like Paul, we don't like to, to, to talk about timings because it, they tend to stretch. They can be very elastic. But uh, we, are, we are comfortable with the idea that there'll be uh, the possibility of reaching a, a, a useful agreement with Mercedes. Uh, and currently, we have 12,000 claimants for that. But it's not just that. It's clinical professional negligence, uh, which includes catastrophic injury. You know, we have one or two very, very large cases, 10 million pounds plus, uh, where people have, have, have really been damaged, either in, in motor accidents or in industrial accidents or whatever. Uh, and a big case we took on a while ago was, was Aston Hall, which was abuse uh, at, a, at, a, at a children's home uh, in, the, in the Midlands. I mean, it was a, it was a horrific case. Uh, we took that on in 2017, 18, and settled it in 2019. So, you know, we are interested in all aspects of this, uh, and that's something which is, which is a growth market also. And something I want to spend a little bit of time on is housing disrepair. Um, an awful lot of our customers because they're impecunious and they drive a, 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 a clapped out car, quite often live in very poor quality housing. Now, poor quality housing exists both in the social housing sector and the private sector. We're concentrating largely on the social housing sector. There's about four million homes in the UK in the social housing sector, and a lot of them are in absolutely shocking condition. This is, this is an interesting business for us because it, it's, it's more straightforward than credit hire. If we get somebody who comes to us with housing disrepair, we will instruct a surveyor, uh, and it's an independent surveyor, and nobody argues about his qualifications. He will go over and he will write a report on it. And the report is accompanied by photographs. And some of the photographs are really horrific. And you mushrooms, mold, drip, you know, cockroaches, whatever it may be. These are terrible conditions for people to live in. Um, and it's very difficult for the housing associations or the local authorities to argue against them. So they tend not to. So these tend to settle, these cases tend to settle much faster than the average credit hire business, although obviously the, the, the sums involved tend to be slightly smaller. Um, this, is a, this is a big business for us. I mean, just anecdotally, 
um, social housing associations just have no idea of what condition their estate is in. So anecdotally, in the village where I live, down in Sussex, there's a, there's a bunch of social housing which has just changed from one owner to another. It's not very many houses, it's about 90. And they've written to all their tenants saying, we're going to make sure that we've inspected all these properties by the end of 2025. That's of no use to anybody if they've got mould coming up the walls uh, because it's just not getting fixed in time. So what happens with this is that, is that is a, broadly speaking, we'll write to the local authority or the housing association with the surveyor's report and almost, almost exclusively they will say, you're absolutely right, we're, we're bang to rights. And they undertake to get that work done and sometimes they don't. Normally they're given six to eight weeks to get the work done. Quite often we'll then get the customer back, the client back to us to say, actually, I haven't seen hide or hair of them. Um, and therefore, we, we, we repeat the process. So it's something that, that, that really is, a, is a, firstly, a scandal, secondly, a, a, a huge problem, and thirdly, we're very fortunate because we have the expertise uh, and the specialist training to enable us to, uh, to deal with that. Um, and as, as you can see there, damp and um, uh, decent home standard claims. It says a thing called the Homes Fit for Habitation Act 2019, and that's put all that in statute. So once again, we're not reliant on common law if a home is not fit for habitation, it's very straightforward to see that it isn't. Um, so we are, we are working capital intensive, as I said before. We are focused on bringing down debt and increasing cash collections. And as I said before, we can reduce the number of vehicles on the road. We can up our cash collections. We, we, we're hiring lawyers all the time. More lawyers, more bums on seats equals more settlements equals more cash uh, coming through the door. So that's, a, that's, that's something which we've been doing through the course of the year. We manage our vehicle numbers very carefully. So vehicle numbers came right down. At the tail end of the pandemic, we were running very hot. We had probably 2,200 vehicles on the road. And that, that's a lot. And that was, that was absorbing a lot of capital. Post-pandemic, we brought that down right down to, to roughly, I think, 1,450 was probably the low point. Uh, we're currently uh, about, 17, about 1,800 vehicles on the road. And we will continue to grow that. But we're growing that very carefully to make sure that we're not absorbing cash. We can do that as long as we make sure that our cash collections are still remaining at a level where it allows us to fund that internally. So as I say, we're continuing to hire lawyers. Uh, we are growing housing disrepair um, very actively. Ultimately, credit hire remains the core business um, because you know, the returns on that and the number of cases that we have uh, remains, the, remains the, the, the core part of the business. We've got a backlog in terms of credit hire of about 19, 20,000 cases. So even if we never took on another case, even if we shut down the credit hire business altogether and went into runoff, uh, we've got probably three years to settle all those cases. And actually, that would generate even conservatively uh, an amount of cash considerably in excess of the current market cap of the company. You'll see their debt a day. So you'll see they're beginning to come down. That's partly a function uh, of the number of housing disrepair we're doing. So that, that skews the average. But broadly speaking, because of the lack of whiplash cases and the courts getting back to normal, uh, they're op they've opened physically. For a long time, they were, they were being done online, which I think was a challenge for, for one or two members of the judiciary. And it's become much easier to get cases through. So just uh, there's, a, there's a, a diagram there which isn't as complicated as it might look. But ultimately, what we're showing is the fact that we are reducing our debt. EBITDA is moving in the right direction. Debt is going down. Uh, obviously, that was helped in the first half by the VW agreement. Uh, we're going to continue to manage debt carefully. I'm not sure that there'll be a, the, a, there won't be a similar reduction in debt in the second half, I shouldn't think. But you will see over the course of time that trend will remain the same. And in terms of current trading, as I said before, we've got current vehicles on the road, about 1,800. Still, most of it is, is motorbikes. Uh, I would imagine this is a guess. 80, 80 to 85 percent of our business now is motorbikes. Um, apart from anything else, a motorbike is more likely to be a write-off than a car is. If a car gets damaged, then it can be repaired largely, and that's an expensive and time-consuming business. If a motorbike is damaged, more often than not, it's a write-off, and that means that our client has the use of the hire vehicle until they get the check, which is the, the replacement cost of the vehicle, and that can take a very long time. So that's more hire days in terms of, of, of the vehicle which we're providing. Keep going on the housing disrepair division, keep putting growth into that. Uh, as I said before, we've got 12,000 Mercedes claims. 
Um, and uh, that will, that, that's more or less static. I'm not sure how much that's going to grow. But don't forget, there are other manufacturers who are also in line for actions, and that will come through over the next few years. Uh, as I say, debt will be coming down. And dividend, we paid, a, we, historically since float, we paid a penny and a half a year. Um, as we did last year, uh, I think we'll be, we'll be looking at what we're going to do with the dividend at the full year end, because by that stage, we'll have a very good idea of how much cash we've generated, how much debt we can afford to pay down, uh, and how to run the business from there on in. Um, I've just put an appendix in there with our share information, 118 million. And as you can see, we're, we're quite tightly held. Uh, Alan and Sam, uh, Samantha is, is, is Alan's wife and is the managing director of Bond Turner, have got uh, about 34.5% between them. And DBA advisors have got just under 30. And you can see we've got some decent institutional names on the list. We've got quite a reasonable retail following, and I hope some of you are among them. Uh, and I, we do enjoy doing these events, and we continue, we continue to do them. Uh, I'm very happy to take any questions, uh, if anybody has any. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, questions straight away at the back. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, yes, um, I'm uh, interested in the uh, housing disrepair, but I have an anxiety about it, which is that it might be pushed back by housing associations and local authorities that don't have very much money themselves. So I'm not sure about the statute you mentioned. I, I, I absolutely believe what you say, that there's a statute that the, it must be um, habitable. Mm -hmm. But um, the risk is that the housing association or lo local authority will say, well, you've got mold because you leave your windows closed. Open your windows. You've got mice by a mouse trap. I'm not being flippant, I'm just saying <laughs> they've got no money to fix things, therefore they'll think up ways to not do it and say to the um, tenant, you do it. Well, I think uh, that's a fair point. I think you'll find that most of the tenants who've been in contact with their association have already tried all these things and they've opened their windows and they wiped the walls down and they bought their mouse traps and their, their raid or whatever the cockroach thing is. I mean, this is the last resort for a lot of people. People don't sit around and say, oh, gosh, I appear to have some damp on my carpet. I better get the housing association to fix it. People have, do take pride in, their, in, their, in, in where they live. I take your point, but it, it is statute. It is statute. And ultimately, they have a responsibility to make sure that their people are living in, in decent housing. So, so far, we have not had pushback on this because apart from anything else, it's appalling publicity for the housing association or for the local authority. And they just, they just don't want it. They're anxious to get it fixed as soon as they can. But their own inefficiencies sometimes mean that, for instance, their work department will, will get an email saying, can you go and fix number three railway cuttings? Um, and they'll push it at the bottom of their list. And then they come back to us, and we, we do the whole process again. So your point is taken in the same way that um, you know, people always say, well, what happens if the insurance company don't, don't pay? Well, we sue them, because we do that every day, and every day we win. Nick, can you just describe how you actually get paid on the housing disrepair? What service do you get paid for? Oh, OK. So we, 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 we apply for compensation for the, for, the, for the tenant, of which we take a share. And also, we get our costs back. So ultimately, we, we um, incur the cost of the, the time of our lawyers to put it through. There are some court cost, costs and so on, which are, come out of our pocket, and we get reimbursed for those. But obviously, we have a margin built into our legal fees which is what we get, and also we get a share of the compensation where appropriate. And so some also goes to that tenant who's been living in those yeah. conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Um, next question, gentleman at the back, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. How do you deal with uninsured drivers? And the other question is, why don't you have offices in London? Uh, and on the house <laughs> in disrepair, why don't you deal with private, uh, private sector as well? I'll deal with those in reverse, if I may. Um, the, the problem, well, firstly, we've got quite enough business as it stands with, with, with public tenants, housing associations, local authorities. Private sector, we are beginning to look at, it's, it's a little bit more difficult because I think a lot of private tenants are a little bit nervous about coming forward for two reasons. Um, number one, obviously, if the landlord um, does the repairs, then he can put the rent up, or he thinks he can. Number two, if they complain and upsets the landlord, he can serve a section 21 and kick them out and then relet it at a higher rent because he's done the repairs. So people are a little bit more nervous about it. That's an educational process, and I think there will probably be some, some decent test cases on this. We have done it. We did one locally for, for one of the people who lives near me, uh, which was a private landlord, and uh, we, we sent him a bill for you know, our entire costs and everything else, and he paid up without a murmur. 
There was no negotiation at all because he knew uh, that he was, he was done for. Um, in terms of uninsured drivers, we, we go to the Bureau as everybody else does, the MIB. So that sorts itself out. And, and sorry, there was a third, there was a, the middle part of your question. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm talking so fast, I can't remember what Bolton, it was. Office, sorry, say again? Yeah, office in Leeds and Bolton, but nothing in... Well, the business, was, the business was started in Liverpool okay. and uh, moved to Bolton because that's, we go wherever there's an insurance hub. And Keogh's, who are one of the big um, defendant lawyers, are in Bolton. And um, we opened an office just across the road from them. And strangely enough, a number of their staff left Keogh's and came to work for us. Um, I think if we were going to open another office, um, then it would be where there's an insurance hub. So obvious ones are Birmingham, Chelmsford, Bexhill, where Hastings Direct is. You know, so they could go anywhere. But in London, they wouldn't, there, there is no point for that. I mean, that's just spending money on expensive um, real estate, which is not necessary. So it's nothing, it's not, it's nothing personal about London. <laughs> There's a, another question further forward. Yeah, this up here, please. No, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I thought you were next. Sorry, we'll, we'll come to you afterwards. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, please. Uh, I'm intrigued by the uh, VW success, not least of which because I'm a long-term Mercedes owner. Uh, and I wondered what was going to happen with them. Um, perhaps you could expand slightly on the Mercedes side and what benefit there is to a driver to signing up because presumably they get paid out anyway. If there is benefit, uh, um, why are you delaying going after the other uh, manufacturers okay. now where you said we're going to do this years okay. in the future? Okay. Um, two things. I mean, if, if, you, if you want to bring your own personal claim against Mercedes, you're entirely at liberty to do so but you'll find it very difficult, quite expensive, and really rather right. complicated. So it is better to have a, a, a firm of lawyers doing it for you. Also, there is an element that a class action does carry more weight than one individual. Um, so under those circumstances, that's, that's how that's going to pan out. And, and we're not the only people doing it. We've got 12,000, which is a relatively modest number. With VW, we had 12,000. Uh, one of the larger firms who was looking after um, claimants had, I think... Uh, 91,000. So, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of Mercedes in there. You're not going to get paid out anyway. You have to be party to the claim. That has now passed. The statute of limitations for that has now run out. In terms of other manufacturers, the statute of limitations runs for a certain period after first knowledge, okay? Uh, after first actions begin so that people would reasonably aware, be aware of what's going on. I don't think anybody has sufficient capital to take on all the motor manufacturers at once. So what's happening is that legal firms are saying, well, we do this one, then we'll do this one, then we'll do this one. Uh, if you look at some of the motor manufacturers, I can't mention names, but if you look in their balance sheets, they've put substantial sums put aside because they know that there's an action coming and they also know that there's a likelihood they will have to settle it. So basically, we believe that there's another three, four, maybe five years' worth of litigation in this, but it has to be on a manufacturer-by-manufacturer -manufacturer basis. Otherwise, everybody will get swamped and everybody will, will, will end up running out of money. A question, question here, please. Yeah, you know, I have two questions. One, um, in one of the slides I had seen, the cost of sales is lesser than the admin cost in, in one of the slides. Right. So generally, I thought, you know, the cost of sales would be greater than the admin charges, okay. generally. Mm -hmm. And second, you know, I'm, you know, you being the market leader, and there are so many cases, like 12,000 plus cases. Are there any plans to use technology to innovate and stuff like that? You know, again, innovation and technology, I didn't hear anything about it. Yeah, OK. Um, I mean, OK, to, once again, to answer your second question first, we use as much technology as, as we can. Ultimately, it's a people business. And it's a people business for, for I mean, we use a lot of automation in terms of the actual claims against the insurance company. There's a thing called ProClaim. So there's an electronic portal. All the documentation from both sides goes into that. Uh, and that, that then goes around like a washing machine. And everything gets, gets put into the right order. Ultimately, it's a people business, though, when it comes to negotiation of a settlement. You can't do that with a computer. Similarly, when the claim first comes to us, we have our screening <coughs> team who ask all the questions. You know, draw me a map, do all this sort of stuff. And various people have said, well, why don't you automate that? And actually, there's a smell test. Uh, there really is. And now people have been doing it for 25 years. And they can tell 
when somebody when the when the story doesn't add up. You said you were turning. Hang on, you said you were turning left, but on that road it looks as though you don't be able to. You know, there's just things like that which which AI or computers are not going to be able to do. A lot of what we do is becoming more computerized in the sense that law firms, law cases generate a ton of paper, and the more we can digitize that, the better. But it will never replace a human interface. Um, in terms of the admin charge and the cost of sales, I mean, there's, there's different ways of looking at that in terms of what we do, I mean, specifically around the emissions chases and, and, the, and the, um, the class actions. But in terms, I mean, there's nothing specifically complicated about it. It's just the way we book it within the system. I'm happy to talk about it online. It's, it's going to be difficult offline, I beg your pardon. It's difficult to go into at this particular stage of the proceedings. Uh, one final question for me, then, if I may. You had um, you have twelve thousand on your um, Sadie's claim. Yeah. Where do you get the claimants? How, how do you attract people into social your media? Yeah. Um, but also uh, in terms of referrals. So we look at our database. You know who who who's 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 had a Mercedes that we've helped them fix or we've helped them get money back from. And don't forget, this is second, third, fourth owners. It's not original owners. It's anybody who's owned a Mercedes or leased it. So in fact, we lease quite a lot of Mercedes. Um, and strangely enough, we've, we've got a claim with those as well. So uh, it's, it's proven, I mean, I, I don't know, it goes up and down, but at the moment, if I open my social media, I'm, I am bombarded with, um, with diesel claim advertisements. And what, some of those have been ours, they're not at the moment, and some of those are our competitors. But quite often our competitors will get a caseload and then they'll ring us up and say, we've, we've got this caseload, we don't know what to do with it, would you like to buy them off us? Okay, Nick, thank okay. you very much indeed. That's thank terrific, you. thank you.